My name is Emily Bakemeyer, and it's my distinct pleasure to welcome you to today's program, Rena Banerjee and Kimberly Pinder in conversation. We're thrilled to have with us artist Rena Banerjee, who received her MFA from Yale in 1995, and is who, who is represented in the current exhibition at the gallery in conversation with the new Stavros Niarchos Foundation Dean of the Yale School of Art, Kimberly Pinder, the first black woman Dean, and just the second woman to lead the Yale School of Art since its opening now 152 years ago today. Thank you for joining us today. We're so glad to have you here. As I mentioned, my name is Emily Bakemeyer. I'm vice provost of the university. I'm an art historian by training, having done my doctoral work at Princeton in early modern Northern European art. During my more than 20 years here at Yale as a provost, I've had the privilege of working with most, if not all, of the schools and departments involved in the creative and performing arts and the humanities, including the Yale School of Art and the Yale University Art Gallery. Yale's commitment and dedication to the arts is, in, is unique in higher education, given that we have four professional schools in the arts, the art school, architecture, drama, and music, as well as the robust undergraduate programs in the arts, both curricular and extracurricular, as well as, of course, the world-renowned, the many world-renowned collections that we have here at the university, including the Yale Center for British Art, the Peabody Museum, and of course, the Yale University Art Gallery. Today's program is made possible by the Martin A. Ryerson Lectureship Fund, and is being held in conjunction with the gallery's current exhibition, which is stunningly beautiful, I may add, on the basis of art, 150 years of women at Yale, the name of the exhibition. And the exhibition and its accompanying publication celebrate the remarkable achievements of an impressive roster of female identifying artists who have earned their BFAs, their MFAs, and their BAs from Yale over the past 150 years marking two recent milestones, the 50th anniversary of co-education at Yale College and the 150th anniversary of the first women students at the university who came to study at the Yale School of the Fine Arts, now called the Yale School of Art, when it opened in 1869, the first professional school at Yale to co-educate per the founding indenture of its patrons. And coincidentally, the same year that Susan B. Anthony and Elizabeth Cady Stanton founded the National Women's Suffrage Association. Since the fall of 2019, and even throughout the pandemic, Yale has celebrated these anniversaries of co-education through ongoing programming entitled 50 Women at Yale 150. These two years of celebration have included a panoply of activities across the university, including lectures, symposia, conferences, along with exhibitions, small and large, showcasing the important contributions that women have made in Yale history. In addition, there have been concerts and performances, both virtual and in-person, highlighting Yale women in all of the creative and performing arts. This current major exhibition at the Art Gallery on the basis of art, 150 years of women at Yale is a spectacular capstone to these past couple of years of celebration. And it's an important launching pad for ongoing illumination and study of the brilliant and creative works and contributions of the women of, of Yale. If you haven't already, or even if you have, I strongly encourage you to come to the gallery to see the exhibition. It's a beautifully curated and an inspiring exhibition. So again, welcome to the gallery and to today's conversation between Rena Banerjee and Kimberly Pinder. I'll now turn the program over to Lisa Hodomarski, Sutphin Family Curator of Prints and Drawings in the, at the Yale University Art Gallery and the lead curator of the exhibition on the basis of art, 150 years of women at Yale. Lisa will introduce our speakers and moderate the conversation. Lisa. Wow, thank you, Emily, for that really gracious introduction, all of your support um, and trenchant advocacy for the arts at Yale, which includes so centrally both the School of Art and the Yale University Art Gallery. Um, it is my great pleasure to introduce today's two Martin A. Ryerson Lectureship speakers, 
First, I am most pleased to introduce artist Rena Banerjee, whose work, Dangerous World, and that's a very truncated title as you will see during this talk. Um, Dangerous World of 2010 is a focal point in the current exhibition. Rena was born in Kolkata, India and moved to America as a child. She now lives and works in New York City. Rena received a Bachelor of Science degree in polymer, polymer engineering in 1993 from Case Western Reserve University and an MFA in painting and printmaking in 1995 from the Yale School of Art. She now serves as a critic at the Yale School of Art. Rena's work draws on her multinational background as an immigrant, focusing her lens on issues of ethnicity, race, migration, and the diaspora. Her work has been included in 14 international biennials, including the 57th Venice Biennale of 2017, as well as dozens of solo and group exhibitions worldwide. Her, world, her works are in the collections of several museums, including the Whitney Museum of American Art, the Centre Georges Pompidou in Paris, the Brooklyn Museum, and several under other renowned collections, including ours. In 2018, Pennsylvania Academy of the Fine Arts and the San Jose Museum of Art co-organized Rena's first solo retrospective entitled Rena Banerjee, Make Me a Summary of the World. A breathtaking exhibition and publication, which included 60 pieces across the media in which she works, including sculpture, painting, and video. That magnificent show was on view at the two organizing venues and traveled to the Fowler Museum at the University of California, Los Angeles, and the Frist Museum of Art in Nashville. Our second speaker is Kimberly Pinder, the Stavros Niarcos Foundation Dean of the Yale School of Art. As, uh, as Emily said, just the second woman and the first person of color to hold that position in the school's entire 152 year history. Dean Pinder received her PhD in the history of art from Yale in 1995. And since that time has taught and served in administrative ca capacities at the University of New Mexico as chair of the Department of Art History the School of the Art Institute of Chicago as professor and chair of the Department of Art History and director of the graduate program and Middlebury College. Before boomeranging back to Yale this past July, Dr. Pinder served as acting president of the Massachusetts College of Art and Design Mass Art in Boston. Dr. Pinder's scholarship explores, the, uh, explores black and black diasporic visual culture her 2016 book, Painting the Gospel, Black Public Art and Religion in Chicago, reflects her close collaboration with local <laughs> artists in the Chicago community. Dr. Pinder was also editor of a major, extraordinarily influential and critically important 2002 compilation of essays in a volume entitled Race in Our History which helped spur a, a national move towards focused multidisciplinary studies of the role of race in art. We are thrilled to have Rena Banerjee and Kim Pinder with us today to engage in conversation, which I have no doubt will be most lively and illuminating. Before I pass the Zoom screen over um, to the speakers a few matter matters of housekeeping, please note that this talk is being recorded. Our speakers will converse for approximately 40 minutes, after which we will open the floor to questions if you have a question, please type it into the Q&A by clicking on the Q&A icon at the bottom of your Zoom screen at any time during the conversation. And I will do my very best to field your questions to our speakers at the end of this talk. Again, please uh, well, join me in welcoming uh, Rena Banerjee and Kimberly Pinder. Thank you so much for that introduction. Um, this was a great opportunity that uh, when you approached me. And um, again, I think there's still people who have their, um, um, oh, it's just an echo, I'm sorry. I guess it's coming from me, I don't know why. But um, I was really great to be approached for this opportunity to choose an artist to view and to discussion with from the show. Uh, and what drew me, not only was it uh, to, 
Rena's work, but also the um, curious overlap that we had, right? As um, being graduate students at the same time at Yale University. So it's really great, I think, for both of us to feel that we have had an experience as graduate students at Yale that shaped who we are, that has really definitely brought us to being on screen together today. Um, and um, that we are have come back. Um, I'm coming back as Dean uh, of the School of Art after serving as Dean elsewhere, as well as President Provost. And Rena will also be, she's coming back as an exhibiting artist, but also as a faculty member. Um, so just that way in which we are overlapping um, was really exciting for me with this conversation. And she and I have had a couple of um, phone calls and email exchanges um, where we were really getting into this overlap of our experiences. So I wanna start with one question that I had, I had asked of her to kick us off um, is that you know we both were very much shaped by the campus in the 1990s um, of Yale and being graduate students here. And I often describe it as um, really experiencing both the abundance of exposure and experiences of being on a research campus, um, an Ivy League campus like Yale, but also the absences that we felt and saw there. Um, and I'd love for you to jump in here, um, Rena, talking about your experience as an artist coming to campus at that time, and especially after, you know, having a science background and what you, um, what you experienced, like sort of your immediate experiences coming to the campus. So thank you, Kimberly, for allowing this conversation to take place. It was such a joy to, to know that we did overlap and we can talk about the time. Um, I think because I came from an engineering background, I really was welcoming the idea of doing research and for the research to feed my art. And it seemed like a natural kind of relationship on how one develops ideas through knowledge. Um, history, of course, is one of the basis by which we reflect upon the larger world and then reflect back on our personal lives and those relationships that grow through school. So coming to school, the relationships I really enjoyed was with the larger university and bringing that larger space into the studio and how does one do that? And I think I was very fortunate to see that the uh, libraries themselves had incredible archives of visual images and taking coursework in the university allowed me to really learn how to see visual images as a language in itself to talk about my personal journey as an immigrant and to talk about America. What is the journey that America would like to take now in making a future for itself? So those two things I see in parallel happening in the work. If we could go to the first image of the artwork, you can see here a real kind of reference to my science background, if I may, with use of minerals like mica um, and definitely the use of um, the physical space of the canvas cutting into the surface of the fabric using textiles, using hair, which references the body, both my own and as well as synthetic, which would be then nylon. So that is uh, very important in the way I was physically making the work and also, you know, a reference to the meaning of the work. How does one bring the meaning of the work if you yourself has a very invisible kind of history? And that would take place in the work in the title. Um, and then this kind of conversation of uh, taking the journey with the audience to go through the title and the image. 
um, was very important from the very beginning. And I'd love for you to follow up on that. We talked a bit about um, very influential professors that you had, both in the School of Art and outside of it. And one of the great quotations that I wrote down that you had said is, um, um, you said that taking classes across campus helped you feel more like a graduate student versus an art graduate student. Could you <laughs> talk more about that? Yeah, I think it was very significant at the time because uh, I had taken graduate courses in engineering and it wasn't like that. There wasn't this kind of liberal arts freedom that you have to interact with multiple um, areas of thought and development, being in contact with other graduate students, other faculty in different programs, really allowed me to see art being something not just in New York City, but in the world. Mm -hmm. And that was a very unearthing moment for me, especially as an immigrant, I felt um, isolated and um, rejected. And so for me to think, well, the US is in the world, it isn't by itself made me realize that I was in the US. If you can imagine that the world is so large and the whole world is your home, then you don't feel as if you've um, kind of came into something new. Um, and everything then becomes an adventure into finding out what all these places you call home are. And that's significant in uh, developing what I believe was immigrant identity and American identity. Yeah, and could you say a little bit more about that? I mean, when you talk about that, um, again, this idea of being on the campus at Yale and as graduate students, like I tried to explain to people who say to me, oh, you must know everything about the campus because you were here as a graduate student. And it actually is a very different experience, right? Because we're not living on campus, literally not living within the ivy covered walls um, in a college. And so we also, as a graduate student, have this, I like to call it a liminal experience, right? We're kind of on the borders, right? Um, we don't go to the dining halls where we have that sense of community like the undergraduates do. We are adults living on our own in apartments um, and also experiencing even the city in a different way than possibly um, the undergraduates are because they are on campus. And so that gets layered, you know, when I know you experienced and I did in the 90s, um, you know, being also an outsider because we were in this predominantly white institution and being the onlys um, in some of our classes or even in our programs. So, you know, that sense of community was very fraught, right? And it was something that I, I would describe it as like a, a kind of a, a push and pull of what community was. You know, we're, we're forming bonds with our co, you know, our colleagues, our students who are all there really intensely interested and excited about what they're there to study. But also we don't really live there, you know, and we don't, we're, we're kind of outsiders and, also the presence that we give in our classes at that time also affected how we were experiencing um, being on campus. And so building community, if you could talk also a little bit about, about that, it'd be great. Yeah, I think in the 90s and 1993, when I joined Yale uh, School of Art, uh, I was the only South Asian in the program and there were only two people of color um, Charles, being my classmate, uh, was my only company in um, having dinners and uh, socializing. We were very isolated from the white majority that was were my classmates. And I think it m was very important, as you said, because you're trying to produce community where it doesn't exist, that your voice has to speak in ways that are acrobatic not just louder, but acrobatic and resilience. And with great uh, fortune of idealism that could be the glue that brings people together. 
So I had to really think about what do I need to do to make myself feel at home and others to feel my presence, that they were at home when they saw me because I am here and I have arrived. Um, so although it wasn't a welcoming wagon at the time, um, I think what I'm hitting on is the importance of mobility when you're making that acrobatic feat to create a community that doesn't, doesn't exist. And for myself as a student, I didn't realize how much that would be important lesson learned for the future as we left school and we have to do that same thing in different locations, whether it's the new job, the new city, uh, the new place where you're having to speak and represent what you feel is this connection that people have with art. So art being that kind of vehicle, that glue that brings us all to realize we do really have one human language, that we're all humans, even though it's so uh, obvious, sometimes the obvious is not accessible. And so uh, art for me was inevitably going to need to make this realization. And I think students have this kind of versatility, this desire to grow up, to participate in the world. And while you're in school, you're not quite in the world, but you're going to be. And there's a kind of excitement, anxiety, and thrill that comes with that kind of responsibility. How will you shape it? And how will you voice what you think is important to make that shape happen? Um, I think those things were really experienced for the first time while I was in Yale in that in-between position where you are an adult, and you're beginning to learn what it means to have colleagues, yeah. you know, partners in yeah. this. Project. I love that, uh, you know, the, the, the idea of a threshold, you know, that you're definitely feeling like you're on a threshold. And I really would love for you to tell just that mini story about how you did build community by creating a lounge. <laughs> um, because and why you felt that you had to take that on. <laughs> To make it happen. Well, I have to say the number of hours spent in the studio are so long that one must have a lounge to relax and to de-isolate yourself um, and to meet who your colleagues are. And especially as I was the one person who was different from others, um, I felt this would be a good project for me to pursue. And I needed to talk to my faculty and make them understand that we needed this lounge where we could come together. And I had their support and cooperation to do this. And we made it as we called it the pit. Um, and it was a lot of fun to see people's excitement to come to the lounge in, in the pit. And so there was this gravity of um, coming to the lower levels uh, where the pit was and the lounge was from above when a lot of the studios were in the above floors in that older building. So um, I think, you know, the architecture of how things um, have proved itself to remain isolated needs to be reconstructed. And so the building itself had to flow in a different way. So really intersecting how do people get separated and what can we do to release them for that kind of flow and mixing. So again, a physical mobility um, had to take place. Yes, and I would say that um, when I think of a counterpart for the history of art students, the graduate students, it would definitely be the fine arts library. Um, that is a, a very core memory for me, had um, a separate graduate student area, a back room where only we were allowed to be there. And we all had the same place that we sat in. And that was um, 
definitely a place where we could be together um, and felt that it was for us on campus, even though it was kind of in the basement, but <laughs> it still was, it was a great place to, to connect. And again, that building community, because there would always be, we'd be there until the library closed. And then we would always have plans to do something after, right? So then it was study and then let's actually go to the bar down the street or there was, um, you know, a Mexican restaurant that would still be open at that time that we would go and get food. So I feel that again, those connections with the curricular space, right? <laughs> like where we were learning and studying um, that also enabled us to have community, um, which was really important. Um, I also wanted to jump back to um, some of the, the professors that you had, you mentioned uh, a number of times to me, Laura Wexler and, and the influence that um, her classes had on your work and maybe some of the work that you could, I know you have a couple of more images from your graduate school days that you could talk to us about. Yeah, maybe we can go to the next image. Um, I think the uh, valuable uh, information and knowledge I've received from my professor, uh, Laura Wexler, was about feminism, you know, and um, she was very open to hearing from me how I saw feminism differently with concrete expectation that I would see it differently. And um, I didn't realize how innovative it was for her to allow that kind of a space to appear. And for me going through uh, photography, which was her area of interest and see how visual images are used to stage history was an important thing. And it was an important thing ingredient in the work itself. So for me in this particular piece, I'm really talking about washing dishes and in some sense, to realize this everyday experience of washing dishes is not um, meaningless. It is not an ordinary chore. But women themselves have a particular fear of these dishes that need to be washed. And if you can imagine how many times my mother and um, other women who are older than me would tell me, I have this education and then here I am doing dishes after my PhD for my family, or I've let go of my ambition or my work because I have to do these dishes. And so dishes then mean so much more to a particular gender, to a particular way of life that we've um, become so used to that also reminds us what is waiting for us after school. So for me, it's a very dark kind of blistering fear of becoming a housewife forever, like a dungeon. <laughs> and so I made this work because of course, graduate students don't do their dishes at all. <laughs> they leave. <laughs> They leave them as they were a lot of times in this student lounge. And this is a time of joy where you don't have to do the dishes. You do your work forever. And you're coming home at 2 a.m. in the morning with pizza in one hand and you know your camera maybe because we, were, we didn't even have digital images at that time in the 90s. So I was always photographing my work to see, what does it look like? What is it? And so, I mean, for Laura uh, Wexler, my professor, being having a place and being able to talk to the professor as an individual to have that kind of intimacy uh, allows you to really develop your ideas. Your ideas come from your personal experience. So these are like scouring, pads that you use to scrub dishes. And then to share how race then influences the way you see feminism. Because of course, growing up in Queens, New York and being in New Haven, the, the people who were scrubbing floors, cleaning dishes, 
and, and the wee hours in the morning or wee hours of the night still working as uh, in labor were people of color and taxi drivers and you know uh, cleaning ladies and all these things kind of loom over you. This is what I may be doing after I graduate from Yale. Um, my parents were fearful that taking on an art studio practice as my future would mean that I would be scrubbing dishes. And my mother would say, well, hopefully you will, uh, you know, meet the right man and you won't have to scrub dishes and you'll be able to do your art. And she was very encouraging of, but the fear was always kind of yeah. embedded in that experience. And being able to talk about feminism wasn't really possible at the Yale School of Art. Talking about race was not possible in the context of our art making. Content was not really a focus so much. And as an immigrant, it was really invisible to our faculty, where would they start? Where would they be able to understand or locate uh, what this work means and have a conversation or dialogue? So the faculty, because they did not look like me, worried for me um, of how they could help to raise this conversation. And so my classes at the university in liberal arts with uh, Laura Wexler was really the first place I was able to verbalize what I was interested in. That's great. There's so many things. I mean, I wish we had a whole nother hour, but let me see if I can grab on some of the things you were talking <laughs> there about, you know, about it being a place where you had to, you, luckily you had other places to have this conversation. I mean, I, I need to like, bring it back to the present now, because one of the reasons why I was very interested in coming back to Yale was that right now, um, the Yale School of Art is the has the most diverse um, graduate population out of all the professional schools at Yale, you know, a real kind of flip, right, from what you experienced in the 1990s. Um, so we actually have 55% of the graduate students on campus in the art school right now um, are people of color. Um, so that, that doesn't mean that all of those conversations are now happening in a way that they should happen, but they are, it's a pressing need and they happen, right? <laughs> because of the fact that it wasn't that we don't have what you experienced as being the only person of color um, in your class or one of two. Um, and so that's what's really exciting for me is to help facilitate the ways in which we have better tools among our faculty and staff so our students don't feel that they have to go outside the school to have that, um, that those resources that we have them internally and connect with the rest of the campus and all of the resources that, that are available and the conversations that are available. I mean, I've been saying to, um, to our students, um, I really think of graduate school as this think tank opportunity. You know, you're in a space like you described, the freedom not to do your dishes. <laughs> The freedom to have everything, you know, not do your laundry for a while because you are have that freedom to be laser focused on your research, on your practice, on your studio. And you can't underestimate how much you will want to return to that for the rest of your life once you leave, right? Um, to actually have all of that. So I often say like the conversations, like I, I'm sad that you and I never crossed paths and could have a conversation like we're having now. <laughs> so many decades ago, it would have been amazing, right? Um, so so um, that's something that, um, that you're talking about that I think is really exciting. And um, I also would love to hear about this, you know, jumping to now. So you have this unique, as I like to call 360 view about being a student at Yale because you were one. 
your daughter just finished being at Yale and you are a faculty member. So I'd also love to hear um, what that kind of having those different perspectives about, about Yale um, has affected you. And I don't know if you could also jump to some other work that you have from your graduate experience. Well, a lot has changed um, at Yale too, structurally. Um, I think that uh, when I was a student, we didn't, we had very distinct disciplines. And so if we can go to the next slide, um, I still call it slide or image. Um, I was uh, very interested in sculpture um, at the time towards the, my last year in 1995 and then created this work um, immediately after leaving school. And I think I started it with the suitcase in mind. I think being a student, you are always feeling like you're in a temporary space. And it's an incubator in some sense in becoming um, whatever you want to be, a, a place of transition and transformation that is very vital. And I think as a teacher, what I've experienced as a visiting critic at Yale, which I continue to participate in, is to be able to see how the role of a student has changed, both from my daughter's perspective as a undergraduate student, um, how she responds, what she's critical of. And this is a growing kind of list of things that we demand upon the university as a learning institution to grab a hold of what these students are breathing because they will be the future. And I think at the time when I was a student, I didn't realize how much impact the world had on me and I had in the world. Um, I would have never guessed that immigrant identity was at all important. It was um, brought up, if I did, in class as almost laughable because we didn't think immigrants were possible you know, important. We didn't think our mobility was anything that we had to reference. In fact, all of the work that we created had to reference other artists. Um, in American history, we never rarely heard um, the names of artists of color, uh, names of women who were artists, um, names of institutions that are outside of the US. We didn't hear, um, we didn't hear about age differences. You know, exhibitions were often this particular uh, kind of microcosm of that generation. You had to wait for the visibility of your generation. I think young people now are not gonna wait for the visibility of their generation when they're in their 40s and 50s to have voice. And I think that has been a dramatic change in the way the world is ready to receive and the capacity to receive is a very important focus of this because we've always made the excuse in the past, in the 90s and in the years to follow, that there's just not enough space for everyone. There's not enough money, there's not enough water, there's not enough food, there's not enough land for everyone. And we've had at some point to stop making those excuses that these are the reasons why we can't share our voices, be heard, make exchanges. And I think now we know these were excuses. And that's dramatically changed for my daughter's generation and has impacted the way I'm seeing things now by having that proximity with the Yale students who are graduate students. Now I can hear what they have to say. And I know as um, a, a person who is teaching that they are generating the future and I can let them know that they are, that they have this kind of voice and power to be a participant now. 
um, while they are graduate students. And I think that is a huge kind of departure from the 90s. Absolutely. I love, I love how you're, that phrase you said, not, no one is going to wait now for the vis visibility of their generation. I mean, I think that's a phrase that says so much about the moment that we're in and also what the goal of education is, right? You know, that that's also changing. You know, there's this whole thing is like, well, you do this and you wait until you are ripe enough, right? <laughs> How some institution is then deemed you ready um, to be recognized. Um, and we're just seeing just the way that information is exchanged now that the waiting is just not tolerated, <laughs> essentially. Yeah. Right? That people just yeah. grab their own visibility and their own platforms um, to present what they feel and what they believe in. I want to, you know, we're about to wrap up because Lisa's going to come on and um, ask some questions. But I did want you to um, talk a little bit about, like you talked about your use of all these different materials, right, that we're seeing in this early work that you have continued um, in your installation work, but um, what's in the exhibition um, at, um, at the Yale Art Gallery are you know, 2D oriented pieces, as well as the beautiful objects that are behind you in your studio. So I wonder if you could say a little bit about, um, about that relationship in your practice. Do you go back and forth? Do you take time off from doing the mixed media work or is it all happening simultaneously and informing each other? It's definitely happening simultaneously. And I think that it's happening as the world is happening simultaneously. Um, if we can go to that next uh, image of the show at the Yale Art Gallery, mm -hmm. um, Dangerous World, you can see the title has become much larger as I've grown. And the image that I used, the figurative work, I wasn't doing figurative work when I was a graduate student. I felt uh, a desire to work in both physical and two-dimensional ways. And, and instead of compromising one for the other, part of how the disciplines have come together to merge is the ability of an artist to be seen as not dominantly a painter or dominantly a sculptor, but in any time, you know, they can be one or the other or simultaneously making the work together. And that's what I do in my studio practice. I have drawings that I'm making. I'm working on a sculpture. I even worked on a, a video um, and it was in my retrospective. And these things are really kind of, ways in which we had a glimpse of um, experience at Yale, because I think in art, in the uh, sculpture department, there were video artists who I met as a student and that really impacted me. I felt like, you know, the content of work was something that was a huge responsibility uh, having come from a university versus an art school. Um, and so it was an intellectual ambition that became much more clear later on in 2010 when I made this piece, Dangerous World. I'm thinking of gender transitions as well as environmental problems. I'm thinking of patriarchy and feminism and uh, lava and flower are really ideas about migration. Um, where lava kind of bursts out of the mountains and is everywhere and cannot be touched and is being formed and is forming new land, you know, that has never been, you know, exposed to air. So the world in itself geologically is still being made and is cooling, so to speak. So all those experiences in science, knowing what the earth is, is coming to fruition uh, with environmental concerns. I was really interested in how pandemics at that time, um, we had the AIDS uh, problems and 
how we were very resistant to understanding what's happening in India and Africa with AIDS. We wanted to believe it only matters what happens with disease here. How we were naming storms by women. And um, so you can see these blue creatures in this visual um, sky is full of things that we see dangerous. And she is with net opening up to catch all the dangerous things instead of running. And she's learned to walk on the new land, which is lava. And she is also immortal and very vulnerable to death and really kind of confronting all these things that we feared and we wanted to believe that the US was a place of isolation. And it's very purposeful that the work is kind of red, white, and blue at the same time. Um, so I think all these things come into play. There's an umbrella made of a uh, batik fabric. There is a reference to clothing, which makes us very uniquely human. And a differentiation in terms of the internal body and the external body as we talk about lava being inside the earth and seeing the earth as a live thing. So all these things really kind of come into play more and more with the work as I grew into um, these different modes of making. That's great. Thank you for explaining the what I see is your titles almost being like poems. They're like little poems that you're creating um, that are descriptive, but also um, giving some context like you just did um, with of, of the work. And now I wanna pass it on to, to Lisa, who is going to um, take over now with some questions. Gosh, thank you both. Um, that was incredibly, interesting and I love the idea of voice that has come up over the past um, 40, 45 minutes um, and the fact that you know one of you is you know Rena you're an artist and and Kim you're an art historian. Um, I do want to um, field other people's questions but first I want to ask one of mine um, uh, for Rena. Um, I have other questions for both of you, but um, the first for Rena. Rena, you've spoken about artist David Driscoll's influence, and he was a towering figure who sadly passed in 2020 at the age of 89. Um, that when you met him and he told you that he was both an artist and an art historian, you responded, how can that be? To which he responded, that when there is no one writing the history of the kind of art you're making, you need to take on that role. Um, and he was certainly a person who was trying to redirect the way in which the work of Black American artists was being discussed. Um, yourself, as a South Asian and an American artist, and also from an underrepresented and often misrepresented background, how did you and how do you interpret uh, Driscoll's practice in your own artwork and teaching? Um, I think, Lisa, the thing is that at that time, I was actually, when I met him, I was only an engineer. I had not yet chosen art as a profession. So I thought of professions and professions as very distinct and not overlapping that you can't choose to be an art historian unless you have an art historian's degree. And so this, again, I'm gonna go back to what Kimberly was saying, this uh, reinforcing is this idea of the waiting room, which is very significant psychological isolation that people of color have experienced in the US. And I think David's calling to action to feel that you do not have to wait for this. It is here when you want it to be here because you exist it was very important for me to understand at that time. 
he did not feel I needed to go to school to be an artist. He didn't need me to feel that I needed to go to school to be an art historian. That you can, by merely existing and voicing, be what you want to be and make the world be what it deserves to be, which is with everybody. And I think there was a certain kind of um, conviction and truth that he found in uh, his way of working that was immediately understood because of his amazing uh, intelligence, intellect, and the emotion that it was not divorced from that intellect. You know, so it was a very spiritual experience to be around him. And certainly my uh, professor, while I was an engineer, Santa Barraza, who was very much in the foreground of Chicano art and the barrio movement, also was doing parallel things with her work. So as the models of how transformation can take place for a whole country was being shared with me. Um, and it was a very powerful experience because the intellectual uh, meat of it was really invested through this experience, this personal experience and emotional experience that thinking is emotional. And it has a validation that can be seen in art and in art history, and they cannot be separated. Um, and I think that was really the beginning for me to understand that we are looking at contemporary art because we are now looking at the world. Great. Um, I have another question from um, Lindsay Adams, who asks, and this is, I think, kind of a question for both of you. Um, would you say that Yale is becoming more open-minded to understanding and, cre and creating the space and dialogue for those uh, uh, that balances multiple identities and diversity, specifically speaking for those who have diverse abilities um, or disabilities? and come to their art with multiple perspectives and experiences. And since you were both here 25 years ago and are now here again, um, I think that this is very much a question for the two of you. Yeah, I'd actually, um, I can answer that in so many different ways. One very um, specific way is that um, we just started um, having regular affinity groups and that is, sites, they're on Zoom right now, hopefully they won't always be, uh, for different parts of the community and how people identify to come together and have time with each other. And there is this absolute acknowledgement of intersectionality, meaning that <clears throat> we have multiple identities, you know? So if there is like a women artist group and a BIPOC, you know, people of color group, um, you know, you can be in both of those, obviously, and maybe you would be even another set of identities. There's so many that we're trying to acknowledge. And again, to help build that community um, that Rena was trying to do with her lounge, <laughs> where actually there's so many ways that it can be done and it can't be done just one way. There have to be overlapping ways in which people can connect with each other. Um, another thing that I'm really hoping to do is to increase interdisciplinary um, opportunities for students to share their work, you know, that they can meet each other across the disciplines and across their identities too, and to bring um, those types of communities together for a richer experience um, in this thing that I keep calling the think tank of art school, right? Um, so I definitely feel, and when you talk about different abilities, neurodiversity, all of those things, always present at art schools and in universities forever, but being able to acknowledge that and to offer support and um, it not being something that is an afterthought or that people um, don't consider because we all know that it's always been there and it still is. So yes, there are definitely ways in which I feel that 
we are addressing all types of diversity as well as pedagogical diversity. And that's why having Rena come and be on our faculty and our wide range of critics that we get mostly from New York City that are able to come and meet our students and go into their studios, that that is an absolute um, important part of the curriculum. Rena, did you want to add anything to that? Yes, I would love to add a little bit. I think uh, being a Yale alumni, I am always reaching out to uh, students who have left uh, both the university or have just graduated, even though I had met them as a visiting critic, and to for them to realize that this relationship or mentorship does not end because they're not in Yale anymore. And that we are a larger community in the world, that whether we call ourselves Yaleys or citizens of Yale, we become a way in which that community can grow outside of the campus and that they I'm available for them, that they and I'm I'm checking on them after they've graduated. And I'm telling them these things, other things that maybe you haven't thought of exist in the world in this country or that country. So that Yale is seen as not just the beginning and ending place on the campus, that it's a reach that is global. And I think that is a very important way of seeing the world um, and education um, must go together you know, in order for you to experience the contemporary. Yep. Great. Um, I just uh, I want to be cognizant of time, but I did want to answer this question because, of course, I come from a third constituency, um, the Yale University Art Gallery on campus. I just wanted to ask Yale, you know, a, well, a statement, Yale is a unique place in that within, you know, a three to five block radius, um, there's a world-class school of art, a world-class history of art program, and, the, and two world-class art museums, as well as amazing, amazing library collections. And I just am curious, when you were students, and even now that you've been back on campus, how did you and how do you engage um, these collections, um, both, but both singularly um, and um, with, with your students? Um, when you were students, were there favorite works of art, favorite collections that you gravitated to, and what do you gravitate to now? Well, in some ways, the things that I've seen when I was a student, uh, the prints at the British Arts Center, what does it mean to call yourself the British Arts Center, which was a very unusual name for a museum in the US, um, really stayed with me and to see that it was a place where there was a vast library and prints, which is part of that library, and that you could see them, you could ask to see them in a room. And certainly um, Sterling, which had its photographic um, rooms where you could look at papers and photographs that were really important. I love the Yale Gallery, especially on the weekends where I could take a moment away from my studio and I loved the oceanic was my favorite. Um, I love for seashells and feathers and all these natural products that became art. And I, I love the Byzantine collection and I still reference um, the gallery and stop at the gallery and stop at the British Art Center to see what's happening. Um, they are part of the community and they're stepping stones to understanding the function of the museum, not just to just be in awe of the collection, but to participate in a way that allows you to address what should the function be in the future? How does it interact with students as well as the public um, who finds themselves um, in the museum and how accessible it, it is. Um, those things are things I think about and bring to studio practice in making the work, 
and also in mentoring uh, students. Kim, did you want to add? Yeah, I would just add that, um, you know, my experience of the collections was um, as a history of art graduate student as a TA. So um, when I was able to get a wonderful tour from Stephanie, the director, when I came back, um, it was this amazing kind of deja vu um, of, of returning back to certain um, works that are still up because they're so important that I remember leading students through discussions around um, and the same with um, with the British art collection as well. So that is, um, again, I was a TA numerous times. So that was my experience. And again, the, the breadth of these collections, um, it was really great being able to teach out of it because you have antiquities to, um, to modernism. And so the whole survey was always there for us. Um, which I still really appreciate. And the antiquities area, I'd have to say, is still one of my favorites. Yeah, and it, it's in beautiful galleries now, for sure. I know, um, it used to be my, my seminar rooms. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I forget that the, the transformation, the renovations pre, predate both of you. Um, yes. So it's, it, the, the Yale Art Fair is a very different entity now, for sure. Yes, um, and also the school, the art school. And the school, <laughs> for sure, absolutely, mm -hmm. absolutely. Um, well, thank you both. I, you know, I, we can't thank you enough for uh, participating today. It's um, been such a treat. Um, and thank you, audience, for Thanks. your questions and for spending your lunch break with us today. Um, I do want to say that the exhibition on the basis of our 150 years of women at Yale will be on view through January 9th um, of 2022, and that the gallery is open to the Yale community during the work week and open to all um, on Friday evenings from 5 to 8 and from 10 to 6 on Saturdays and Sundays. It's a great idea to reserve. Um, it's, not, it's not a time ticket, but just to reserve like a day pass um, on our website um, that absolutely guarantees your your ability to come in on the day you choose and we really hope to see you in this exhibition and in the galleries um, as we continue to open up over the next few months um, thank you again Rena and Kim and it's been such an illuminating and exhilarating hour and thank you um, audience be well thank you